I just note again that he did serve in the military in Germany. Um, uh, what year were you in Germany? 61-63. Okay. Um, Berlin crisis. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, he's going to take us back to those days and others surrounding them. A uh, very momentous time uh, in the space program. <coughs> Um, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Jim, have at it. We get the, uh, the light message. Can you hear me back there? No. Yes. No. I heard one no and five yes. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to be reading from a script here, so I'll try to make eye contact as I can. But uh, as, as was mentioned, uh, this story actually begins in Germany, but it goes uh, a long way from there. As some of you may know, I have developed a habit of making a presentation once a year for the last 13 years. My early presentations were done with 3x5 cards and an overhead projector. Jim, <laughs> pull that mic closer to you. Okay. How's this? Oh, okay. <laughs> My early presentations were done with 3 by 5 cards and an overhead projector. Somewhere along the way, laptops and PowerPoint took over our hallowed meeting halls, <laughs> much to Gary's chagrin, and I was forced to confront this more technically challenging mode of presenting. Fortunately, I have a son who's here tonight, actually, who every year has helped me along with the admonition. You can do it, Dad. After all, it's not rocket science. <laughs> that phrase, rocket science, with that connotation, came into usage only some 57 years ago during a period in history known as the Sputnik moment, when America and the world first became aware of such rocket science terms as orbital velocity, countdown, satellite, liftoff, thrust, and so on, and quickly associated them with complex, difficult to understand processes. Can you relate to the term Sputnik moment, as referred to by President Obama in his 2011 State of the Union message? To be aware of this period, firsthand, you would have to be in your mid-60s to remember the reaction of the nation and the world to the launching by the former Soviet Union of the world's first artificial satellite, Sputnik, in the October of 1957. By the way, President Obama had not yet been born at that time. The reaction in the U.S. to this signal event was profound. We were dismayed and our Yankee cockiness was dealt a blow to know that those Russian potato farmers had outsmarted us. There was fear and anxiety that Russian missiles, with their recently demonstrated nuclear bombs, could now reach targets anywhere in the U.S. Finally, it was a wake-up call and a challenge moment which resulted in some major societal changes and subsequent technical achievements. <clears throat> My presentation will examine first the period from 1945, just after World War II, until 1957, which led up to and produced Sputnik, and second, the post-Sputnik period from 57 through 69, which resulted in a techno technology revolution and the landing of men on the moon. This is a story about rocket science, and my son Stan over here, the PowerPoint advisor, gave me this cup as a gift after a recent trip to the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral. It says on one side, just what part of multiple complex equations don't you understand? And on the opposite side, it's only rocket science, with a plain English explanation of each equation. I'll pass that around for your education if someone would like to come up here and get it. <laughs> The space race, as it is commonly known, may be segmented into two separate but intimately related activities or endeavors. Number one, this missile race to develop nuclear-tipped ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and the space race proper to compete in manned space exploration and its intended <coughs> technology requirements. This was an epic competition between two nations, the USA and the USSR and two ideologies, capitalism versus communism. 
for superiority militarily, politically, and technologically. It was a centerpiece of the Cold War. It had many key players, such as Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson, versus Premier Stalin, Khrushchev, and Brezhnev. But two dynamic personalities were at its heart. One an American, though of German birth, and one a Russian, of Ukrainian birth. During this period, the name Werner von Braun was widely known as America's chief rocket scientist and space technology promoter. But no one knew at the time the identity <coughs> of his chief Soviet rival, the chief designer, Sergei Korolev. Werner von Braun, as I mentioned in my pre presentation last September, was the founder of King Olympic and the creator of the V-2 rocket, the ancestor of all modern rockets. He was an enthusiastic promoter of space exploration and a master of rocket science and engineering. He was a key player on America's space race team. He launched our first satellite. He developed the mighty Saturn rocket that took Apollo to the moon, among many notable achievements. <clears throat> Sergei Korolev was the leader and key figure in the Soviet space program from its beginning until his untimely death in 1966. His name was a state secret, unknown to the world until after his death. He was simply referred to as the chief designer and he was personally responsible for most of the first of the Soviets in the early portion of the space race. The world's first ICBM in 1957. The world's first satellite, Sputnik, in 57. The first animal in space, Light of the Dog, in 1957. The first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, in 1961. The first woman in space, the first spacewalk, and so on. He was the designer of the R-7 rocket which launched Sputnik in 1957 and today still delivers astronauts and cosmonauts to the International Space Station. Our story begins in February 1945 at the German Rocket Testing Center of Pinamunde in the waning days of World War II. Werner von Braun has organized the evacuation of his technical staff and the destruction of the facility in the face of the advancing Soviet Army. They traveled some 250 miles to Nordhausen in central Germany, near Middelburg, the infamous in the underground V-2 factory. On April 1st, with the advance of the U.S. Army, the group is ordered by the SS to further evaluate some 400 miles south to the Bavarian Alps, where on May 2nd, 1945, von Braun intentionally <coughs> surrendered them to the U.S. forces to avoid capture by the Russians. On April 8th and 9th, the U.S. forces occupied the Middlework V-2 factory and cleaned it out. Of over 100 V-2 rockets to be shipped back to the United States, along with 15 tons of documents and drawings that Von Braun had hidden in a nearby mine shaft. This was done just in time to meet a June 1st deadline to turn that region over to the Soviets per Allied agreements. The Soviets, on the other hand, were also actively looking for von Braun and his team, for V-2s. They were looking for technical documents and the like. When they overran Pina Mundi, it was technically destroyed and abandoned. Then when the Middleburg factory was turned over to them, it had been stripped of the V-2s and parts. And so when they finally located the German rocket scientists and engineers in American custody, they made unsuccessful efforts to entice them to join the Soviet missile program with money and promises to stay in Germany. In the final analysis, after the dust had settled, the spoils looked like this. The Americans had secured von Braun and almost all of his top people. A document trove of over 65,000 drawings, designs, and reports, and over 100 complete and carefully <coughs> assembled V-2s. The Soviets, on the other hand, scrounged to get a few V-2 engineers and technicians <coughs> Very little documentation and pieces and parts for potentially 10 to 15 V-2s, along with access to a number of supplier factories that fell within their zone of occupation. The division of these spoils would mark the very beginning of the race into space. The manner in which they were exploited would be the first lap of that race. The American effort to learn from this technological windfall initially involved convincing von Braun, who in turn convinced many of his team to move to the USA 
and work on missile development. In an operation called Paperclip, over 125 German scientists and engineers were reunited with their V2 hardware and software in Fort Bliss, Texas. This is Ivan Braun here, uh, the tallest guy in the front row. They were reunited with their V2 hardware and software at Fort Bliss, Texas, near the White Sands in New Mexico Missile Range, where they would spend the next five years reassembling and launching over 70 V2s with many variations. High altitude research and multi-stage rocket technology were the prime outfit of these efforts, along with the education of their American cohorts. The Soviets, on the other mean, Meanwhile, had set up shop in occupied Germany and attempted to salvage whatever remained after the American cleanup. They attempted to lure German V-2 specialists from the American zone and even considered an attempt to kidnap von Braun himself. <laughs> they were successful in luring Helmut Grotkrupp, the head of the radio guidance group for the V-2, with lavish promises to his wife Ingrid of remaining in Germany with luxuries and post-war torn country. Grotro became the leader of a sizable group of German V-2 specialists assisting their Russian bosses in recreating the missing V-2 hardware and software. In September of 1945, this rocket shop in Germany was joined by a Russian rocket scientist slash engineer recently released from the Soviet Gulag. Sergei Korolev. Korolev, a rocket enthusiast and aeronautical engineer before the war, had been caught up in Stalin's infamous purges in 1938 and had barely survived his harsh imprisonment. Korolev was a take charge personality who rapidly organized and disciplined the Soviet rocket development effort. In late 1946, Stalin ordered the whole operation move from Germany into Russia including Grotro and 150 of his German V-2 team, who were essentially kidnapped with their family and moved to Russia. At a test site named Kasputin Yard near Stalingrad, Korolev, with his growing team of Soviet and German rocket experts, would launch their meager supply of 11 painfully reconstructed V-2s in 1947 and 48. On April 14, 1947, Korolev, who by now was in charge of the Russian long-range missile development, was summoned to meet with Joseph Stalin to discuss the Soviet missile program. Stalin was interested in the prospects for a long-range missile to counteract the U.S. long-range bombers equipped with atomic bombs. Stalin knew, but did not share with Korolev, that the Soviets would soon have an atomic bomb of their own with which to arm a long-range missile. Stalin's support was all that Korolev needed to plan and pursue an aggressive program that resulted in rapid advances in Soviet missile technology. Three missiles of consequence from this early period, that is 1940, excuse me, 1947 through, 40, through 55, became operational. The R-2, the R-5, and the R-11, or SCUF, that you might have heard of in recent history. The R-2 was the first Soviet tactical ballistic missile and was a 50% Russian, 50% German design that was essentially an enhancement of the V-2 with a range of 370 miles and a payload of 1,250 pounds. The R-5 was Russia's first strategic missile and was 100% Soviet design with a range of 800 miles and a payload of 3,150 pounds. And finally, the R-11 was a highly mobile battlefield ballistic missile, an improved lightweight design again derived from the V-2 with a range of 170 miles and a payload of 1,500, miles, 1500 pounds. Excuse me. Variations of the R-11 are scattered around the world today in many nations known as the Scud missile, the Kalishnikov of ballistic missiles. While Korolev was consulting with Stalin in Russia, Von Braun was cooling his heels at Fort Blitz and talking to the Rotary Club in El Paso about the glories of space travel. His dreams of an ambitious rocket development program in America had not materialized. Unlike the Soviet Union, post-war America was booming with consumerism and secure in her monopoly on nuclear weapons. 
The U.S. Air Force had just been formed in, 19, in September 18th of 1947, and its Strategic Air Command was an overwhelmingly powerful deterrent to any potential adversary. Von Braun and his team spent the years between 45 and 50, 1950, at Fort Bliss and White Sands, tinkering with the captured B-2s and small research rockets, with no missile development of any consequence. In 1947, the total U.S. missile development budget was a meager $47 million, a fraction of one shuttle flight. Von Braun's dreams were on hold, and he struggled to keep his team together and occupied. Then, two events would conspire to challenge America's security complacency and give a new urgency to the need for a serious missile development program. In August 1949, the Soviet Union detonated their first atomic bomb, signaling an end to the U.S. monopoly on nuclear weapons. Then in June of 1950, the North Korean Communist re regime with backing from Russia, invaded South Korea, <clears throat> initiating the Korean War and turning the Cold War hot. The fear of communists with atomic bombs on the warheads of ballistic missiles caused a revision of U.S. strategic military thinking. In April 1950, the entire German rocket team at White Sands was transferred to the Army's defunct Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama, and given the task of developing a tactical missile that could deliver a nuclear warhead to a range of 500 miles. With Von Braun as a technical director, this organization became the U.S. Army's, no, not the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Army's Ordnance Guided Missile Center, the first comprehensive ballistic missile development operation in the United States. The first hardware from this new organization was the Redstone Missile. America's first true ballistic missile, which was first test launch on August 20th, 1953. Von Braun's Redstone was a highly modernized evolution of the V-2 with a range of up to 200 miles, reduced from the original 500 to meet a Korean War timetable, and it carried a payload of up to 6,300 pounds, capable of carrying a three and a half megaton thermonuclear warhead, which would be developed later. This was the first missile to ever have a nuclear warhead. The Redstone design, as we shall see, was versatile. In addition to becoming an, an operational military weapon, modified versions of the Redstone went on to become real workhorses in America's space race. In summary, by the end of the beginning of the missile race, the Soviets were well in the lead due to Korolev's aggressive leadership and the strong and consistent backing of Stalin and then Nikita Khrushchev, his successor, when Stalin died in 1952. These Soviet leaders, in turn, were first driven by their paranoia with America's strategic air superiority and nuclear <coughs> monopoly. The U.S., on the other hand, had initially dawdled with smug complacency and squandered what could and should have been a significant head start asset the nearly complete German rocket team with their plans, their dreams, and experience. <coughs> In the early to mid-50s, Werner von Braun, somewhat frustrated in his dreams for space exploration, went to the public forum with his message. In 1952, he published his concept of a manned space station, trips to the moon and Mars, and how men will exploit space. In a series of articles in Collier's Magazine, some of you older folks might remember, entitled, Man Will Conquer Space Soon, with wonderful illustrations by Chester Bonestell and Von Braun's concepts. In these articles, Von Braun described designs, logistical criteria, orbital mechanics, human factors, requirements, and the like, for trips into orbit, to the moon, and to Mars in a technically accurate, yet understandable fashion. Von Braun's words and Bonestell's paintings were exciting fare to millions of America, including my 15-year-old imagination. Von Braun also collected these concepts into a plan for a manned mission to Mars entitled The Mars Project, which was published in 1953 and is still considered one of the most influential books on planning human missions to Mars. <coughs> 
1954, Von Braun began work with Walt Disney on a three-part series for television. The first part, entitled Man in Space, was first broadcast on March 9, 1955, drawing 42 million viewers. <coughs> the second highest rated TV show in American history to that date. The final episode, a clip of which you saw earlier, was called Mars and Beyond, and was broadcast in 1957. These efforts to educate the public and arouse public support for its space explorations were Von Braun's outlet in light of the lack of interest by the U.S. government at that time. In November 1952, the U.S. exploded the first thermonuclear device, hydrogen bomb, named Ivy Mike. Oops. Named Ivy Mike at the Pacific and a Weetok Atoll. It vaporized the atoll, by the way, with a destructive force of 10.4 megatons of GNT over 450 times that of the Nagasaki atomic bomb, which had ended World War II. Only nine months later, the Soviets also detonated their first test device. The advent of the hydrogen bomb had a monumental effect on the missile program in both countries. Its devastating destructive power caused great concern and a highest priority effort to weaponize this device by marrying it to an intercontinental ballistic missile. <clears throat> At this early stage in the development of the hydrogen bomb, a major question arose as to how heavy and how large a mature H-bomb would be. Ivy Mike had weighed some 132,000 pounds, certainly much too heavy to be practical for a ballistic missile payload. The answer to this H-bomb size question was quite different for each adversary, and this would greatly affect the outcome of the space race for the next decade. In February 1954, a U.S. science advisory team named the Teapot Committee predicted smaller, lighter, and more powerful hydrogen fusion warheads, and urged that the highest priority be given to long-range ballistic missile development. This position, known as, quote, the thermonuclear breakthrough, completely changed the picture regarding ballistic missiles by the United States, and in late 1954 led to the accelerated development of the Atlas ICBM, with a projected thermonuclear warhead weighing some 3,000 pounds. The Soviets, on the other hand, in 1953, shortly after their entry into the thermonuclear world, would base their estimates regarding the size of a mature hydrogen warhead on a hasty and informal analysis by Andrei Sakharov, the father of the Russian H-bomb. Sakharov overcalculated the required weight of a thermonuclear bomb to be about 11,000 pounds, resulting in a complete warhead weight of some 14,300 pounds. This estimate turned out to be too high by several orders of magnitude. But his mistake would predetermine the success of Soviet astronautics for many years to come, since this payload member would determine the size and capacity of the first generation Soviet ICBM and its launch vehicle, Korolev's masterpiece, the R-7 Semyorka, which is still flying today. Korolev's promise to produce a Soviet ICBM to deliver a hydrogen warhead before the Americans had gotten him the full support of Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet premier. This powerful backing meant that Korolev had consistent and powerful accesses, access to resources within the Soviet Union. This support and his already demonstrated head start in tactical ballistic missiles meant that Korolev did have good prospects to beat the Americans. The missile that evolved from his efforts would exceed his expectations. The R-7 rocket family would become the most significant rocket launch vehicle in the history of spaceflight. Some would accept uh, that with Von Braun's Saturn V, but there have been over 1,800 R-7s launched since, the, since it put Sputnik on. And it's still taking our only way to get astronauts to the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. Carlos promised, oops, there we go. 
The R7 concept began in October 1953 when Korolev was given the charge to design an ICBM which could deliver Sakharov's eight, six and a half ton warhead to 5,000 miles. This at a time when the world's state-of-the-art rocket, the Soviet R-5, could only carry a five to one and a half ton payload about 800 miles. These ambitious requirements would require Korolev to completely rethink every aspect of rocket design and come up with a new concept. A souped-up V-2 would simply not do the job. Korolev's revolutionary design borrowed heavily on ideas from an old friend and fellow space travel enthusiast Mikhail Tikhonrabo, a talented, visionary rocket scientist engineer who is long on ideas but short on practical implementation skills. Tikhonrabo's ideas had to do with the packaging of booster rockets in a manner which could produce heavy lift capabilities. These packets or clusters of booster rockets could, could, could be configured to produce a design which also solved many other design challenges. Korolev's revolutionary design for the R-7 also meant that increased performance could be achieved by adding more small rocket engines, which were available, rather than needing fewer but larger rocket engines, which were much more difficult to build. The R-7 propulsion system has five primary engine modules, right. each of which has four V2-sized combustion chambers. The central core with its Sustainer engine, again with four combustion chambers, is surrounded by four strap-on booster rockets, each of which has four combustion chambers. This arrangement provided a total thrust equivalent to 20 V2 engines. Another revolutionary idea at the time was the use of 12 small steerable rockets called vernier rockets used to control the missile, rather than the internal and external rudders used previously by the Germans. The R-7 became a reality with its first test launch in May 1957 and on August 21st of 57 achieved the status of the world's first ICBM years before the U.S. with a successful flight of 3,700 miles landing dead on target. Khrushchev boasted of this accomplishment and claimed erroneously to the world that the USSR was, quote, making missiles like sausages. As it turned out, the R-7 was a flop as an ICBM, though, due to practical implementation and military factors, and only 10 or 11 were ever deployed. But, as we shall see, Korolev now had a vehicle with which to astound the world and the basis for the world's first spaceship. The Americans, in the meantime, were still more than a year away from the test flight of their answer to the R-7 a much more modest first ICBM, the Atlas, with its smaller one-and-a-half-ton payload and three-engine configuration. The Atlas would not become a factor in the first chapter of the space race. America's close, closest successful missile at this juncture, that's August of 1957, was von Braun's Jupiter C, which was a souped-up redstone which had successfully delivered a third-scale model of the Jupiter warhead some 3,350 miles in a nose cone reentry test on September 20th, 1956, nearly a year before Korolev's R7 success. <coughs> Von Braun's team had also now had hardware capable of reaching orbit on a more modest scale. In 1954, a global scientific program was announced that specified the period from July 1st of 1957 to December 31st of 1958 as an International Geophysical Year, or IGY, or IGY and half maybe, to study the Earth's atmosphere, the ocean, the polar regions, and outer space. There was strong support for the use of Earth satellites to help achieve the IGY agenda in spite of the fact that satellites existed only as rocket scientists' predictions at that time. On June 28, 1955, President Eisenhower announced that the, quote, the U.S. would launch small Earth-circling satellites as part of the IGY. Ike and the U.S. military were interested in establishing precedents for satellite overflights for future reconnaissance satellites, planning for which was already underway. Von Braun and his Huntsville team had 
proposed launching a small satellite a year before that, in June of 1954, using a modified redstone as a launch vehicle. But this plan, called Project Orbiter, was soon joined by a second proposal from the Navy Research Lab called Vanguard. Despite vigorous arguments that Vanguard was a start from scratch program which would be much riskier and take longer than the mostly mature Redstone Orbiter, the Vanguard was given the go-ahead. Red, the Redstone, the Redstone's V2, Pinamundi, German heritage was a major factor at that point. Von Braun's work on the Jupiter Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile did, however, permit the continued development of the Jupiter C test vehicle to solve warhead re-entry problems. This modified Redstone was, not coincidentally, also capable of launching a small satellite. Several of these Jupiter Cs were put away just in case by Von Braun and company. The Soviets were prompted to respond to Eisenhower's satellite challenge by secretly taking steps to beat the Americans. Korolev's goal was to reconfigure his R-7 launcher, which had much more power than needed, and launch a satellite before the beginning of the IGY. He, however, first had to demonstrate that the R-7 worked as an ICBM, which he had accomplished, as I mentioned earlier, on August 21st of 57. And then he returned again on September 7th with Nikita Khrushchev as a witness. Khrushchev then at that time gave him the go-ahead to launch the world's first artificial satellite. On October 4th, 1957, at 10.28 Moscow time, Space Age was born with the launch into Earth orbit of Sputnik, a tiny, shiny ball which was a last-minute creation of Tikhon Revlov. Korolev's buddy. This event and this small object would change the world's socio-political perceptions in an unexpectedly profound and dramatic manner as one of the most memorable technological milestones in human history. Sputnik was a highly polished metal sphere, 23 inches in diameter, weighing only 184 pounds most of which was batteries to power two shortwave radio transmitters, which were the only instrumentation on board, which would broadcast their beeping signals to the entire world as it circled the globe every 96 minutes, <coughs> thus proclaiming Soviet technological prowess. The world's reaction was immediate and immense. In addition to the beep beep heard by radio operators, visual sightings with naked eye were reported from around the globe. Seeing Sputnik, often with the brilliance of the stars that moved swiftly across the sky, left a profound impression on all observers. <coughs> Actually, the observers were seeing the 90-foot long second stage on which were mounted reflective panels since the Sputnik was so small. The image of the Soviet Union as a nation of backward technology was thoroughly dispelled, and Americans now began to doubt their military and technological superiority vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. Von Braun and his boss, General Medeiros, received the news of Sputnik's success while hosting Neil McElroy, the brand new Secretary of Defense, at a reception at the Officers Club at the Army Ballistic Missile Agency in Huntsville. Von Braun, usually unflappable, very nearly exploded with anger and frustration. Quote, we knew they would do it. We could have done it two years ago. He referred to the fact that former Secretary of Defense Charlie Wilson had directly ordered General Medeiros to inspect every single Jupiter C launch to make sure that Von Braun didn't accidentally launch a satellite. Von Braun went on to inform McElroy. For God's sakes, cut us loose and let us do something. We have the hardware on the shelf. Vanguard will fail. And finally, we can put a satellite up in 60 days, Mr. McElroy. Just give us a green light in 60 days. The Soviets, meanwhile, were glowing, big time. Nikita Khrushchev was astounded at the reaction to Sputnik. <coughs> On October 10th, he met with Korolev in Moscow to congratulate him and to request a new triumph in time for the 40th anniversary of the Bolshevik Re Revolution, on November, uh, which was happening on November 7th, only 26 days away. Korolev proposed that a second, more sophisticated satellite be launched. 
this time with a dog as passenger. With Kick and Ravov's ideas, a huge effort and a lot of improvisation, Sputnik 2 was designed and built from scratch in time to beat a November 3rd liftoff aboard another R7 rocket. A dog named Laika became the first living creature to be orbited into space. Laika survived the launch and a few orbits, but was not intended to be brought back to Earth. Sputnik 2 weighed over 1,100 pounds, a quantum leap from that of Sputnik 1, and the military implications were ominous. The Soviets obviously had at their disposal the means to deliver a nuclear missile at any point on Earth. <clears throat> The unexpected, the unprecedented success of the two Sputnik flights in one month and the lack of a U.S. response caused a great deal of unease in the American public. This prompted an attempt to prematurely launch a 2.9-pound grapefruit-sized satellite using the Navy's Vanguard launcher, which had been chosen over von Braun's Jupiter C earlier, as I mentioned. In a much publicized and widely televised event, some of you may have seen this. Yeah. On December 6, 1957, this vehicle, America's anemic answer to the Sputniks, blew up on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral in a spectacular explosion captured live on TV with an audience of millions. <laughs> the newspapers were quick to dub it the Flopnik, or the Kaputnik. <laughs> Von Braun and his team were finally given the green light to reset retrieve the Jupiter C they, they, they had stashed away earlier, just in case. It was designated as the backup for the second Vanguard attempt, which was aborted because of technical problems. And on February 1st, 1958, the uh, Redstone <coughs> launched America's first satellite, the 31-pound Explorer 1. America was now at last in space. The social and political fallout from this Sputnik period was enormous and would have far-reaching and long-lasting effects on American society in general and our future in space. The Soviet lead, the, the, so, the Sputnik led to widespread fears of our vulnerability. For the first time, geography and oceans had ceased to be a barrier to our now nuclear-armed adversaries. Entrepreneurs began selling bomb shelters. Our smug attitude about America's technical superiority received a severe blow. And people were concerned about our future. President Eisenhower's popularity took a nosedive as confidence in his leadership was challenged by the Democrats in Congress, led by Senator Stuart Symington and Lyndon Johnson both of whom had their eyes on the upcoming 1960 presidential race. Ike's vice president, Richard Nixon, also eyeing the race, tried to distance himself from the president's hands-off position. All of this maneuvering, using fear and the, the fear and anxiety of the American public, contributed to the election of John F. Kennedy on November 1960. <laughs> Within a year of this Sputnik moment, a number of major corrective actions were taken to address our perceived shortcomings. Number one, Congress passed the National Defense Education Act, pouring billions of dollars into the U.S. education system. Number two, the Department of Defense formed the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or DARPA, to eliminate inter-service rivalries in this arena. This is the agency that went on to create the internet that we know today. Number three, on July 29, 1958, President Eisenhower signed the National Aeronautics and Space Act, thereby creating NASA. And number four, Congress dramatically increased the budget for the National Science Foundation to foster scientific research and technical education. After the Sputnik's moment of glory, the initial phase of the space race settled down, with the Soviets launching three more increasingly heavier Sputniks with their huge R-7 rockets, and the U.S. launching another small explorer, and finally the even smaller Vanguard. Both countries also worked frantically to actually deploy operational nuclear-tipped ICBMs. <clears throat> 
John F. Kennedy used this, the perceived missile gap in his 1960 victory over Richard Nixon for presidency of the U.S. In reality, this missile gap did not exist, and Kennedy was aware of it. But he also understood the political power of the backlash from Sputnik, and he used it very effectively. The Soviets' significant advantage at this point in the space race was its ability to launch much heavier payloads into orbit than the U.S. The R-7, by May of 1960, had orbited a five-ton Vostok satellite, a preview of a coming attraction. Khrushchev was eager to exploit the Soviet leadership in this arena and exhorted Korolev to provide bigger and better firsts Korolev was eager to comply. In 1959 was his shoot for the moon year. In a series of firsts, he sent Luna 1 on a flyby of the moon, Luna 2 to impact the moon in September, and on October 7, 1959, Luna 3 took the first photos of the far side of the moon. The Vostok was in reality Korolev's one-man spacecraft, and on, October, on August 19, 1960, he launched two dogs into orbit and successfully recovered them. Korolev was aware that the Mercury program, the, with the Mercury program, the Americans were close to a manned mission also. So after four additional unmanned automated dog flights, with Vostok now validated and with encouragement from the first group of Soviet cosmonauts, he set the date for the first manned mission. Yuri Alexei Gagarin had been personally selected by Korolev from a group of 20 cosmonauts to command this historic mission. And on April 12, 1961, at 9.07, Gagarin blasted off with Korolev and his team worried about all the unknowns, uncertainties, and previous failures. Korolev was very popular amongst the cosmonauts, by the way. He was kind of like a personal buddy to him. Gagarin's flight lasted one hour and 48 minutes, one orbit of the Earth, and ended in near disaster when his descent, descent capsule failed to initially separate from an instrument module. All ended well, though, and Gagarin parachuted safely back to Earth, becoming the first man in space and an instant hero of the Soviet Union and of the world, which celebrated his unprecedented accomplishment with lavish praise. Three weeks later, on May 5th, Alan Shepard became America's first traveler, riding the Freedom 7 Mercury capsule on top of Von Braun's over-reliable Redstone rocket on a 15-minute suborbital flight from Cape Canaveral. An American space hero at last, and the country was catching space fever. Still, history was repeating itself, and America was once again a day late and a dollar, dollar short. And our newly elected president, Kennedy, was paying attention. Although Kennedy initially had little interest in spaceflight, he was quick to realize the enormous interest of the American public. He ordered his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, an early supporter of these activities, to find out what space mission the Americans stood the best chance of winning. Johnson consulted many experts, including Von Braun, who advised, quote, if he had an excellent chance of beating the Soviets to the first landing of a crew on the moon. On May 25, 1961, Kennedy addressed Congress where he recommended a commitment to, quote, achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth, end quote. The space race had now formally begun. Since its founding in 1958, NASA had been busily taking control of all the scattered institutions essential for a viable space program. And by July of 1960, it finally acquired von Braun's Army Ballistic Missile Agency at Huntsville, now renamed the Marshall Space Flight Center, which it's still named. With von Braun and his team came the early design work for the Saturn rocket, logically named as a successor to the Jupiter with both owing their heritage to the Redstone, which had been derived from the V-2. Kennedy's 1961 challenge gave NASA a dramatic new focus, timetable, and target, the moon. James Webb took over as NASA administrator in 1961 and gave strong guidance to a fast-growing and effective organization dedicated to meeting Kennedy's goals. 
NASA grew from 46,700 total employees in 1960 to 411,000 in 1965, it's peak year, with expenditures ballooning from 523 million to 5.25 billion in the same period, a growth of 10 times. Meanwhile, Corliss Space flight program still had no mandate to go to the moon. The Russians hadn't accepted the challenge. And he now was competing for resources and mili with military interests who were more interested in a practical ICBM to replace the R-7 version. These competing interests drew resources away from Corley's plans. His continuing list of space records using the R-7 and the Vostok spacecraft kept Khrushchev happy and did assure Korolev of moderate support from the Soviet rulers. In August of 61, Vostok II took cosmonaut German Titov on a 17-orbit trip lasting more than 24 hours. This was still six months before the U.S. put John Glenn on a three-orbit, five-hour flight in February of 62 on his Friendship 7 Mercury capsule on top of an Atlas launcher. The, first, the very first American in all. Korolev then upstaged NASA again by launching two Vostoks, number three and number four, into closely matched parallel orbits on August 11th and August 12th of 62, whereupon the two cosmonauts passed within three miles of each other, thus the first rendezvous in space while accumulating another 112 orbits. In June, in June, in June of 1963, the one-person Vostok series was completed with another rendezvous attempt of two spacecraft, Vostok 5, and then another first, Vostok 6, with the first female in the space, Valentina Karashkova. Khrushchev had directed that a female cosmonaut be orbited to show that men and women were treated equally in the Soviet Union. The one-man Mercury Atlas Orbiter series, as noted earlier, had begun in February of 62 with John Glenn's Friendship 7, followed by three additional Mercury orbital shots, with the final mission on May 15, 1963, with Gordon Cooper doing 22 orbits over 34 hours in Phase 7. The Mercury program was a great success and learning experience for NASA, as was the Vostok, an even greater success for Korolev. An interesting anecdote regarding Kennedy's challenge in the moon race is that on September 20th of 1963, Kennedy, addressing the UN General Assembly, proposed that the US and the USSR conduct a joint program to go to the moon. Khrushchev initially rejected this offer, but reconsidered and was poised to accept it when Kennedy was assassinated several months later. On August 3rd, 1964, the Soviet government finally decided that landing a man on the moon would become the main goal of the Soviet space flight program. Although this was three years after the American commitment, Korolev now had his mandate. Fortunately, he, like von Braun, had kept some designs under the table. His giant N-1 rocket had been studied for some years as a vehicle for a flyby mission to Mars. And in September of 62, he had been given the go-ahead to start the development on the N-1, on the vehicle that would compete with von Braun's Saturn. Once NASA had been given the directive by Kennedy and Congress to go to the moon, the debate on how to do it became a matter of prime importance, since this would set the parameters and specifications for every aspect of the program. Four possible mission profiles were considered. First was a direct ascent in which the spacecraft would tra travel directly to the moon as a unit, land, and return, leaving its landing stage on the moon. This would require a huge launch vehicle called the NOVA. And of course, this was von Braun's preferred approach. He liked to do things in a big way. Number two was the Earth orbit rendezvous, where you'd launch multiple components in the Earth orbit and assemble a direct ascent spacecraft in Earth orbit. The third one, which not very well, um, uh, not very well known, was the lunar surface rendezvous method, in which you'd launch two spacecraft directly to the moon. First, an automated fuel truck, and secondly, a manned vehicle to be refueled on the moon. 
And finally, the lunar orbit rendezvous method that we all know about. The LOR, launch a component spacecraft into lunar orbit and then separate the lunar lander module for landing with the command module to stay in orbit for a later rendezvous and return to Earth. The LOR profile was selected on June, July 11, 1962, after Von Braun finally conceded that it was the only plan that could meet Kennedy's timing goal. The main outcome of this decision was to permit the sizing and configuration of the various mission components. And in particular, the mighty Saturn V booster rocket which would still be enormous, but much more man manageable than the NOVA would have been. Later in 1964, Korolev's team, Korolev's team also ad adopted the LOR profile for very similar reasons. The next phase of the, phase of the race to the moon involved the development of the tools and techniques to live for extended periods in space and work at tasks like maneuvering, docking, extra vehicle activities, and so on. The U.S. effort for this phase involved 10-man flights of the two-man Gemini spacecraft, which was designed from scratch to perfect the critical task needed and required for the LOR moon mission. Korolev, on the other hand, was initially driven by Khrushchev's insatiable appetite to beat the Americans this time with the first multi-person mission. Since his own multi-person craft, the Soyuz, which is still flying today, was several years in the future, he made do by gutting the interior of the original Vostok, by removing the ejection seat system and requiring the cosmonauts to fly without spacesuits. This provided interior space for three cosmonauts who launched on October 12, 1964 on a 16-orbit day-long mission, another spectacular Soviet first. This, quote, jury-rigged spacecraft was known as the Voskhod-1. Another configuration known as the Voskhod-2 which was equipped with a makeshift inflatable airlock and a two-man crew furnished the last of the significant Soviet firsts in manned spaceflight, when Alex Leonov became the first man to walk in space on March 18, 1965. His 10-minute EVA nearly met disaster when his spacesuit ballooned, nearly trapping him in the airlock. He actually vented his suit a little bit to deflate it so he could get back through nearly trapping him in the airlock. These two milestone flights ended the Vauxhall series with ample theatrics, but no real contributions to the now fledgling Soviet moon landing effort. The Gemini program, meanwhile, proceeded at a methodical pace, starting with two unmanned missions, leading to the first manned mission on March 23, 65. Milestones for Gemini included the first American EVA by Ed White, on Gemini 4 in 22 minutes. By the way, Ed White was an old lab partner of mine at the University of Michigan some years ago. Along with four other EVAs of up to five and a half hours by Buzz Aldrin in Gemini 12. The first use of fuel cells for electrical power allowed for extended missions of up to almost 14 days for Gemini 7 with Frank Borman and Jim Lovell. Most importantly, though, the Gemini missions demonstrated and refined the critical maneuver, rendezvous, and docking techniques and hardware that would be required for the Apollo lunar missions. The successful Gemini program ended with Gemini 12 on November 15, 1966, having met all of its goals and paving the way for Apollo. On January 14, 1966, the Soviet space program was dealt a crushing blow when Sergei Korolev died from complications during what was to have been minor surgery. Korolev was the towering figure in the Soviet space flight program and had almost single-handedly been responsible for its successes through his grasp of the technical, political, and administrative needs <clears throat> and his remarkable leadership in the effort to beat the Americans into space. 
His accomplishments with Sputnik and Yuri Gagarin were responsible for the American response in the space race, and his loss to the Soviet program would prove to be crucial. His replacement, Vasily Mishin, while talented, was not up to the huge challenge. The American program had now moved into its final phase, Apollo. After delivery of the first completed Apollo command module in August of 1966, and fixing countless problems in the thousands of systems embedded in the craft, the first full ground test was scheduled for January 27, 1967. Astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee were sealed up and, and were suited up and sealed inside the capsule on top of the Saturn rocket, enduring more than five hours of countdown when Mission Control received the fatal message from Grissom. Quote, we've got a fire in the cockpit. Frantic and heroic efforts to save the astronauts were to no avail. Post-mortem analysis revealed major deficiencies in the Apollo command module, which re required major redesign and crucial time from the moon race schedule. The primary defects were the 100% oxygen cockpit atmosphere with many flammable interior materials and poorly designed and executed wiring. The Russians, seeing a fortuitous gap in the American program due to the Apollo 1 fire, expedited the completion of their new Soyuz spacecraft, their answer to Apollo. Despite many defects identified in ground tests and three unmanned test flights, political pressure again dictated a first manned flight on April 23, 1967, in time for the Communist Navy. Communist uh, cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov with trepidation flew this ill-fated mission. His solar panels and control systems failed, and yet he managed to maneuver the craft into an adequate re-entry path, after which his primary and reserve chutes failed, along with his retro rockets. And he slammed back to Earth at 400 miles per hour, cursing, quote, This devil ship, nothing I lay my hands on works properly. The other cosmonauts blamed Mishin, saying, With Korolev, this would not have happened. On November 9, 1967, just nine months after the Apollo 1 fire, America launched von Braun's enormous Saturn V rocket for its maiden flight, with Apollo 4 as a payload, a nominally perfect unmanned mission, which validated the complete launch vehicle with all three stages functioning and the command service module separating and firing its service module engine several times to simulate the low lunar maneuvers. The five huge F-1 engines had done their job, and Saturn's redstone heritage as old reliable had been reaffirmed. By the way, in 13 launches of the Saturn V, they never lost a payload. Von Braun's baby had demonstrated that it was ready for the task ahead. Meanwhile, the Soviets were scrambling. Their moon rocket was Korolev's N-1. In spite of whoops. This note on this, uh, this slide, the little circle there in between the two uh, rockets, that's a man standing there to give you a sense of scale. <laughs> the N1 was a huge vehicle on the scale of the Saturn V, which Korolev had adapted from an earlier design concept for a manned Mars flyby mission called the TMK. In its L3 mode, that's its moon landing mission mode, about which we may talk a little bit about later, the N1 weighed less than the Saturn V Apollo in its moon mode and produced more thrust but for a shorter time, giving it less lift capacity. With the death of Korolev and with the Soviets' late start in the moon race, the N1 was not a thoroughly tested vehicle. In spite of its maturity and complexity, with a main stage of 30 engines that had to be synchronized without computers, Mishin was under pressure from the Soviet hierarchy for an earlier flight. The Americans finally, with prospects for an imminent moonshot attempt, were at last pressuring the Soviets. 
The stage was now set for the final lap in the race that had begun 24 years earlier at Pina Mundi. <coughs> 1968 saw a series of successful flights of the Saturn with the Apollo spacecraft. After two further unmanned missions to iron out final details, the first manned mission, Apollo 6, was launched on October 11, 1968, hmm. using a Saturn 1B <coughs> booster for an 11-day Earth orbit checkout mission for the redesigned command mod uh, Apollo command module. Only 20, 20 months after the tragic Apollo 1 fire, it had to be redesigned completely. These successes and concerns about the Soviet plans, which were still very much a mystery because they kept everything secret, emboldened NASA to revise its mission plan for Apollo 8 and shoot for the moon. That is, a flight around the moon. A highlight of this circumlunar mission was a famous Earthrise photo from Lunar Orbit, taken by Bill Anders. And Frank Borman's Christmas Eve message from Earth, or just Christmas Eve message to Earth from Lunar Orbit. Quote, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless you, all of you on the good Earth. End of quote. Broadcast live. The Soviets were shocked by an Apollo 8 circumlunar mission. At a January 1969 meeting at Baikonur, their, their version of Cape Canaveral, 69 meeting at Baikonur to discuss their concerns, a senior Kremlin minister addressed the group with, How can we get out of this mess? In response, Mishin stole the page from Korolev's playbook, and on January 14th and 15th, 1969, Launched two of the brand new Soyuz spacecraft. Soyuz 4 with one astronaut was joined by Soyuz 5 with three cosmonauts, two of whom were then transferred to Soyuz 4, the first successful docking of the Soyuz or any other manned spacecraft. The success of this mission led to boastful claims by the Soviet press that was that this was, quote, the world's first orbital space station. The larger catch-up event, however, was a major failure. On February 21, 1969, the gigantic but somewhat immature M1 rocket lifted off from the launch pad at Baikonur and rose for 69 seconds before exploding at 38,000 feet and 60 miles downrange, crushing the Russian <coughs> lunar landing dreams. The Americans were now ready. After Apollo 8, two further Apollo missions served to methodically verify our readiness for the main event. On March 3, 1969, Apollo 9 began a 10-day mission in Earth orbit to test all of the docking, transfer, maneuver procedures for the command module and the lunar <coughs> excursion module, our left. Then on Apollo 10, we launched from Canaveral for a daring full lunar mission rehearsal including traveling to the moon, flying the wind to descend within nine miles of the lunar surface. Uh, with the full success of these missions, Apollo 11 was set to go. On July 16, 1969, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins lifted off from Pad 39A at Cape Canaveral on top of Von Braun's Saturn V rocket. Four days later, on July 20th, after a harrowing descent to the lunar surface, leaving only 20 seconds left of fuel to maneuver, Armstrong radioed to Mission Control in Houston, Houston, tranquility base here, the Eagle has landed. The space race was over. The Soviets, however, had been frantically busy trying to prepare and repair their N-1 for an unmanned lunar flyby mission before the Apollo 11 liftoff, in secrecy, of course. On July 3rd, 1969, just 13 days before the Apollo 11 liftoff, as witnessed by all the prominent people in the Soviet space and military establishment, the mighty N-1 rocket, 30 engines reached, reached full power and had rose from the launch pad some 600 feet before doubling over and collapse, collapsing on the pad with its full load of over 5 million pounds of fuel, Ooh, wow. causing one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in history, destroying the rocket and the launch facility itself. 
Much <laughs> disappointed and chagrined, the Russians did manage to launch a small unmanned lunar lander which reached lunar orbit on July 17th using the R-7 again, three days before Apollo 11. But then it crashed on the lunar surface on July 21st after Neil Armstrong's quote, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Indeed, the race was finally over. And now, I would like to uh, close with apologies to Burl Hodges. <laughs> if we can make this thing work. Jim? Yes, sir. Sorry, you're yeah. We have to leave soon. Yeah. It's okay. You're not going to kill me. <laughs> Sing along if you'd like. Can you hear me out here, Yes. yes.